the speaker is a uh, it is a bachelor and master then is a PhD and is postdoc on chemistry. Um, no. <laughs> I don't need to say Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. That the post of the day NIH part of it. Um, all right. So today we'll speak about. So I'm sorry for being late. Uh, there was a, a catastrophe in the traffic <laughs> on the way to Jerusalem. Most of it was in the Tel Aviv part, not in the, not in Jerusalem. Anyway, so what I would speak uh, with you today is about uh, the connecton, its structural function, and and mainly on the evolution of the connecton. And, um, well, just because I, I want to say the, the acknowledgement at, at the beginning because I always forget that everybody is tired at the end. So, to thank all the students and the collaborators uh, that worked on this project, uh, measuring the connectome, the connections in the brain, and, and uh, characterizing the white matter and its, relative, and its relative contribution to cognition. Uh, is, is the theme of the lab, is the thing that, uh, that we investigate, and most of the, t the students here and the collaborators uh, were involved in that project. So, to say, to, uh, I always start this, this, uh, this uh, uh, presentation by taking this quote from Marcel Meshulam, that nothing defines better the function of the neuron than the connections it forms. So we can debate on that and have a discussion, but obviously if we will be able to, to, to measure the, the structure, the fine structure, of what the neurons are connecting with, we might be able to say something about the function without measuring it at the end. So what is the connectome? Just to put everybody on the same, on the same level. So the connectome is the mass array of neural connections that form any connections in the brain. And it is not specific to neurons, and it's not specific to a region, it's everything. All the cells in the brain have connections, not only neurons, but also glial cells. And it's not only on the cellular level, it can go through the, the me mesostructural level within a region, the connection between layers, for example, all the connections between regions, all the connections between lobes, all between the hemisphere, etc. So it is all different of, of orders of magnitude, and all of these structural, con all of these structural components ensemble the, the connectome. So the connectome, if you want to, to, to try to characterize it, it's like a map, it's a graph. It's a graph that, that represents the connections at different scales of, of magnitude. All right. So why it is important? As you will see in the lecture, we will try to, uh, to say why it's important to measure the connectome, just because when you open the, 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 the textbook, Eric and Kandel and other neuroscience, basic neuroscience textbooks, when they speak about the, connect, the connectome, or in, in its ancient world, the white matter in the brain, it's there, it's stable after we have developed, after the age of five, six, and that's it. And what we have is what we have, and with that we'll have to continue with our lives. And in the, in the last decade there is a, a, a growing reasoning that the white matter, first, is not stable, it's very dynamic, it's as dynamic as anything else in the brain, as any, any function of the neurons, any plasticity that happens in the gray matter will be reflected somehow in the white matter and in the connectome uh, on its different scales. And, and that there are, we know that if something happens to the connectome, if something happens to the white matter, then the brain doesn't function properly. So obviously, uh, it's an important uh, f uh, component of the brain. So in order to understand if it's important or not, first we need to know the topology, who connects to who, and, and why in one subject it connects better than in another, and how it is related to any functions that we do. We need to understand these relations, what are the structural functions relations. Most of these things are very basic, and most of them were investigated in the last, in the last, year, uh, last uh, several years. We do believe that uh, the connectome affects our cognition and our behavior. There are some evidences for that, that people that have better connections between different regions will have better abilities or 
when we say better connections, we have, we have to define what it is, but, but this is the, the theme. And some people, some people might say, we can have a discussion, I'm not standing bit behind this center, but some people say people that are really, really into the connectome, that as the genes encode our body, the connectome might encode ourselves, our mind, etc. So it goes much further than that. The most traditional way to measure the connectome is by using electron microscopy. Just because you need to characterize each and every tiny little connection. The long connections, if, if you have a long one of an axon, or even the tiny connection between, between two dendrites or, or synapse row buttons or whatever. And that was done on the C. elegans. Uh, so this is a very uh, um, uh, famous representation of the connectome. They cut it into tiny, tiny little pieces. They characterize each and every tiny component and extract the, the, the nervous system and eventually ensemble this connectome. So this, this connectome of, of the worm uh, composes of, of 302, 306, 310, depends depend on which connectome you are looking at, but roughly 300 neurons, and you have all the connections between them, and this is the basis for a lot of simulations of, of how connectivity happens in a, in a very basic uh, nervous system, how connectivity happens, how it alters, how, how can you affect it, how can you learn from it, how plasticity happens, etc. So it was the basis for a lot of, of uh, studies. Since then, there are a lot of pros and cons uh, related to measuring how, how to measure the connectome. And, and some people are going, not me, some people uh, that are working in this region try to uh, prepare a connectome of larger species. Uh, one of the, the, the latest uh, achievements was cutting the mouse brain in that, in, that, uh, in that procedure that was done in, in uh, Heidelberg cutting the entire mouse brain in the 3D electron microscopy, the slice after slice after slice, and storing the data in a computer. And this is where it stands. Because the data is, is so big, it's so big that you can extract tiny little pieces out of it and explore them. To work on the whole brain together, it's impossible computationally at this stage. I'm sure that it will, we will be able to do, to do it by an extra super, super, super smart computer <laughs> in 15 or 20 years, but at the moment it's, it's very limited. So there are people, and, and it takes a lot of time. Just imagine that for the worm you need to have like thousands of slices for the mouse brain. It's, it's millions, millions of slices of electron microscopy. And, and then somebody has to sit and just reconstruct a neuron after neuron after neuron after neuron. It, it ends. So people that are in favor of that say that once we will have it, we will have a full characterization of all the neuronal connections, and obviously that will be a significant achievement. It will allow investigation of the network complexity at a new level of detail. We will just see everything, so from the single neurons to the entire, to the entire system. And it will provide, and this is, I think, the, the motivation for such studies, it will to provide the basis for uh, for, uh, for simulations, because if we know how the connections are working, we can simulate how the brain will act, we will see how the connectivity affects function, and maybe we'll be able to simulate something that happens there. People who are against it will say first that it is an enormous amount of data and we don't know where to begin with it, which is true. More importantly, in my view, this is ex vivo data, which limits our understanding about the dynamics of these connections and, and, the, and the relation to behavior, because we are li limited in the amount of samples, one at the moment of the mouse brain, we are limited in the amount of samples we can do this kind of analysis. And, and to say the least, it does not include, or the people that are working with it did not in, wanted to include or, or intended to include information on other cells than neurons, glial cells, etc., which have a growing uh, um, uh, importance in neuroscience. And, and, and some people might say that I'm among them, some people might say that they have an equivalent importance to that of the neuron brain function. Oh, so that was like the introduction to the connectome, and, and so I'm working with MRI, and MRI is by far not at the level of electron microscopy, and will never be. Uh, and, and the question, so this is what I have, and the question is that if I want to, to, to measure something about the connectome, I have to start with this kind of hypothesis, that I don't have to see everything in order to know it's there. So this is the basic, a basic con a co concept, concept in this lecture, because we are 
uh, humans, and, and most of us, the vast majority of us, rely on the visual system in order to survive, in order to behave. And we like to see things. So we believe something when we see it. So, and this is the concept of imaging. Once, once, once you will have a very nice image that you will be able to see, for example, the gray matter or, or the white matter or connection or synapse, you will believe it's there and this is how you can progress with science. Another field in imaging says that you don't need to see. So a good image is not a, so in, in, in terms in, in medical imaging or, or in imaging in general, when you go to, to biomedical engineers that works in, in imaging, a good image is not a very sharp and nice image. This is not a good image. This is overkill of information. A good image is an image that has a sufficient amount of information, even if we don't see with our eyes the borders or whatever, uh, sufficient en enough of information in order to characterize what's inside the image. So the idea, and we'll elaborate that on that in, the, in, in a moment. So the, the question that we ask is, do we really need to see every little tiny synapse to know that it is there and that it forms a connection <coughs> and that it affects the connecton? So this is the question. Some people say yes, some people say no. And do we really need to know each connection where, where it stands as, 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 as a unit? As a unit, you say this is connection number one, this is connection number two, and separate those in order to characterize the system. And, and I will try to show you that, that I think we, we don't need it. Just because with my methodology I can't. <laughs> I can't do it, but I think it, it is sufficient. And, and just to give you an example of why um, um, why that, these hypotheses or these research themes are um, uh, acceptable, let's, let's have a, a way of two, look, two, two approaches to look at, at axons, for example. So axons, the most traditional way is to use electron microscopy. You cut it, you, you, you take the tissue out, you cut it, you do electron microscopy, you see the axons and then you start to count, count, see the diameters, how, how much myelin do you have, etc., and you calculate all, all many factors of that. Very tedious, uh, a lot of work uh, to do it. Another way, for example, non-traditional, is to use MRI. There is a method that we have established about 10 years ago that uses diffusion MRI to extract the axon diameter distribution. I don't see the axons. MRI is not of the level of microns. I will not have a resolution of a, a, an image at a sub-micron resolution. But I can use magnetic properties in, in this, in this uh, uh, method, we use diffusion MRI, in order to extract geometrical parameters on the micron scale that I can characterize them mathematically without seeing it. And then I can get, can get this function. So getting the information without seeing it. So this is, this is the, what I'm trying to pass. So this is like remote sensing, like remote sensing. I don't see the axles, but I remotely sense them with diffusion imaging, and then, and then I can characterize them. So this is measuring the axon diameter distribution in vivo in the, in the rat brain. So let's speak a bit about the macro and microstructure of the connectome as a whole. So we are using diffusion MRI. And diffusion MRI is not new method, and, and I'm, I'm sure that everybody here has heard about it. So diffusion MRI on the basic level, diffusion tensor imaging, allows us to, equ to extract many indices on the, on the brain, diffusivity, mean diffusivity, fractional anisotropy, uh, the orientation of these tensors inside, the vo inside each voxel, and then trying to relate those to parameters of fiber orientation and then fiber microstructure, etc. So this is the basic method, and there are several other levels on top of that, trying to extract the axonal density, trying to extract the axonal diameter distribution. All of these different indices on a very not, uh, I, I can't see the, 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 the axons or the, or, the, or the cells that contribute to the signal, but I can characterize them, I can separate them and, and know they are there. And, and the most basic way to look at it is using fiber tracking. So, and, and fiber tracking is, is, um, is a visualization <coughs> tool. It, it relies on, on what is the input. One of the input is diffusion tensor imaging, which is not the best input. Uh, we already know because it, it has a lot of errors and artifacts inside it, where fiber cross or partial volume, etc. There are other inputs that you can put into tractography to make it better. 
high angular resolution diffusion imaging, child model, Axcalibur, you name it, whatever you can put it, you can, you can use also other parameters, non-diffusion, T1 variants, T2 variants, whatever you want, you can plug it in and use it to do the tractography, constraint tractography to extract the tract, the tract that you extract. But once you ex extract them, depends on, on what was the input, then you have a connectivity matrix, which area in the brain connects to with any other area, and you can work on this uh, uh, substance. Uh, yeah, so this is how it looks like on, on, on one level of magnitude of the entire brain, and, and I think in a minute it will zoom into different regions. So you can use tractography in order to look at different scales, the different scales, and extract the, the connection between different regions, and, and, and you can do it at different resolution in order to see different orders of magnitude. For example, for a certain uh, tiny regions within the visual cortex, you can uh, see the local connectivity, or even if you are lucky enough to have a good magnet, you can get into the, into the cortex itself and see how the fibers just go into the cortex and, and, and uh, have a lot of crossing areas there. So you can do diffusion tensor on, on, on a very uh, uh, varying orders of magnitude and get a substantial amount of information about this connecton. I don't want to get into the technical details of how you can achieve it on a better way. So you, you know DTI, you know tractography. There are better ways to do tractography that are not based on DTI that can give a much robust and um, a much more robust and validated um, uh, result. And it's not only it's not only that we diffusion tensor imaging. So when people uh, think of diffusion imaging, they they already think we can, this is characterized as the white matter. But the white matter is not it is not the entire complexity of, of brain connection. In a way, the white matter of the human brain, that is about 40% of our brain, has characterizes only three or four percent of the connections. Most of the connections are within the gray matter, are within the cortex. Even though those are tiny connections, but they are there. And just to say that diffusion imaging is not uh, blind to this connection. So this is in the right brain. You can see that when we go uh, to the gray matter, we can just follow the, 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 the path of the dendrite. So this is in the, in the cortex, and this is in the hippocampus. You can see that the diffusion information can give you, can give you, qu can quantify also uh, connectivity types within the cortex. Connectivity types of the cortex. So we have a method, with, without going into the, the, the technical details because really they are boring, we have a method that, uh, that enables us to measure these quantities of the connectome, even if it won't be at the level of a single synapse or a single neuron, it will be on the level of the system, and we can characterize it. And to say first, if it's important to anything, uh, so, I'm in the Department of Neurobiology, just a side to us, there is the Department of Zoology. And what I learned from them, that things that are important in biology are things that are preserved in evolution. So, if you have, a, let's take, for instance, genomics, if there is a certain gene that is important, if it's preserved in an entire order, for example, in the entire mammalian class, which means that it is very important for mammals, for example. And they, so this work was done in collaboration with my good friend Yossi Yovel, which I think you was here a few weeks ago. And uh, so he started from a very, um, um, he wanted to look on, on how the MRI of the bat will be um, for his own purposes. And then, you know, to be, just to say, to admit at the beginning, I thought that the bat is really a, a nice flying rat. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I didn't think that the brain would be much different from, from a rodent. But it was completely different, uh, with a lot of, of interesting structures, not only on the gray matter, but also in the connections that it formed. And then we started, so that happened five years ago when we started to do bat imaging, and from that, we, every week it came in with another type of bat and then another type of animal. And through that project, we have started to work on the evolution of, of the mammalian connectome, just collecting the brains of different mammals. So, we'll get in a minute to what the database looks like, but, but to start what we know about mammalian evolution. So there's a lot of, of, of studies that look how, how mammalian brain 
evolved, and this is part of, of evolutional studies that look on, on how evolution uh, um, is represented by differences in or, or differences or, or in, in, the, in the encoding of certain genes uh, in the body. And it's not only um, uh, people that are working on mammalian evolution don't look at the brain, but they look at the entire representation of the genome in order to define uh, the tree. So this is a conventional uh, evolutional tree of, of the mammalian class. And the question the people that are into evolution often ask themselves, so this is a representation of the genetic representation of evolution, does the brain have a different kind of evolution? Uh, or different representation of evolution. And just to say the least, so if we look, so these are, these are three mammals uh, that we can see that they are very, very uh, similar as embryos. But when they grow up, eventually, they look completely different. And, and it's not that their appearance is different as well, also their cognitive system is completely different. So the, the cognitive system of, of so I forgot which kind of monkey is that, of the pig and, uh, and the humans are completely different. Lamu, Lamu, right, are completely different. And it's not only embedded in the genes, it must be also affected by other factors. Uh, that, that, that we can. So these are the people that work on the evolution of the brain thing. And the way that people look at it so far is just by exploring first size. So size is, is, is very important in this thing. So the larger brain you have, people might say it's better. The larger, the better. And, and if it's not only the volume, so the more neurons you have, the more computational units that you will have, then it's better. So people that are counting the amount of, of neurons. And there are certain laws uh, that try to see if there is a relation, is there any relation between brain weight and body weight. And the ones that deviate to the higher are better in the abilities or cognitive abilities and ones that are lower are lower so there are some sort sort of laws like that that people look at it and other looks at different uh, scales of size between white matter and gray matter and there is a certain connection between those the, the, the more gray matter you have the more and more white matter you have so if you have more, more white matter as the brain grows and there are some uh, people that are looking which is com very difficult to do, looking at the presentation of functional system and, and very uh, um, primary functional system. So where is the visual system located? Where is the motor system located? And see how it is located in different, in different mammals and how it is evolved and trying to predict what was the, the, the brain of the common ancestor of the mammal. So this is where it stands in a way. A lot of missing information because obviously, if you want, if you compare the visual system of the opossum, it looks much, much bigger than what we have in the human brain. Just because the, the primary, primary visual cortex is only part of the visual system of the human brain, which the opossum doesn't, doesn't use, it doesn't do very high uh, cognitive processing of visual information, which the human brain does. So obviously, this comparison is, is, is complicated. So we have a method of measuring this, the connection and, and getting, just to say uh, uh, before that, so we, this is the, the, what we call the MAMI, uh, MAMI database, which is mammalian MRI database, which is uh, now about 100 different species that we have collected with a lot of replicas, so altogether about 180 different samples. Just say none of the animals were, was killed uh, for this study. All of them were killed for other purposes not related to us. Uh, we just, uh, really they don't. They just, they, they, they die in zoos, in, in the different zoos around the country or in the wildlife and get to Bendagan where the veterinary hospital is and the pathologi pathological uh, institute is that screen for different viruses or whatever they have and we can get the brain sample. The diversity is according to what here? Genes? The, 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 the yeah. This is the evolution of modern evolution of trees. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. So this is the database, I think, with, with MRI, is the largest database of, of MRI of, of mammalian brains that exist in the world. For sure, with diffusion imaging that nobody else can be. For some of these mammals, I think this is the first representation of the MRI ever uh, that we got. If, some, if, if you want to hear some the humor side around this project, I can tell you how, how we got some of the samples afterwards. 
but the, the, let's not waste, waste uh, time on that at the moment. So the first thing we did is to see what is, if we can re recreate things that are already known from, uh, from histological work, just to see if the connection between the amount of white matter and gray matter that I showed you before, if we can recreate it. And we could recreate it from MRI, meaning that MRI is, is, is reasonable parameter that shows the same, same observation. So what to do with the data? What to do with this enormous amount of data? So first we can look at it. So this is uh, um, a representation of, of the connection on, on, one, one on the largest scale for the human brain. You can just look how it would look for a mangabi, monkey, hyena, savoa, food bat, um, ibix, yeah. a red kangaroo, rabbit, and the wild rat. So you can see we can get it looks completely, it looks different, not completely, it looks different, it looks different, but the amount of information we get is on the very similar order of magnitude, just because we scan them, we scan them at a comparative resolution, comparative resolution, which means that the amount of information that we measured for the largest brain, it's not the human, we'll get to that in the moment, but for the largest brain is on the same not order of magnitude, even fine order of magnitude, as the tiny, tiny, tiny little animal. Can you say something about the color coding? Yeah, in a minute, in a minute. Okay, let's say something about, <laughs> about the color coding. I'm sorry. So this is, this is a, a, a convention of looking at, at the fiber tracks uh, from diffusion tensor imaging. We just have a convention of, of coloring the fibers in red when they are crossing from left to right, in blue where they are going from inferior to superior, and in green when they are going from uh, anterior to posterior. Uh, so it doesn't mean anything, it's just nice. It doesn't mean anything. It's confusing, yes. Yeah. It will go away in a minute, believe me. So <laughs> this is uh, the fiber tracks that were extracted for the smallest brain that we measured, and this is for the largest brain that we measured. This is the trident bat. The entire bet, which is about the finger, weighs 6 grams. And this is the striped dolphin, the entire dwarf dolphin weighs about 150 kilos. And you can see that the amount of information that we get is, is comparable. So I can compare this to... How, how do you, what, do you mean, yeah, what do you mean by comparable? It's in a comparable resolution. The resolution of the scan is comparable to the size of the brain. It means that the amount of information that I gathered, so there is information that I'm gathering on the brain, is similar. It doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean that I can extract this, the, the, the same amount of, I can extract the same, I just measure the same amount of information. That will be, now depends of, on the amount, for example, of white matter that they have, on the amount of ordering of the structures inside the brain, etc. So the amount of voxels, the amount of voxels, so the, the, the brains are scanned in 3D, and the amount of voxels that are, uh, that so, so in imaging we, we, cut, we cut the brain in different voxels and we characterize each voxel. So the amount of voxels in the dolphin brain was similar to the amount of voxels in the trident brain, but the resolution, the resolution here was about 2.5 millimeter, and here it was 75 by one cubic. And you are not limited by the Oh, unlimited. It took 30 minutes for that, and four days for that, okay? <laughs> they are all there. They are all there. Comparable in, ter in terms of the information that I measured. Because it's stopped, it's resolution. It doesn't tell me much about the brain. The method stops the digital resolution. Yeah, it's not the digital We'll say the meaning. So just to understand, a red point in a dolphin corresponds to a much bigger uh, box of size, and therefore the red point is actually an average could be. Green, could be, could be, could be, could be. I take that criticism, but with it, we'll see what we can do, all right? Just to say, w what is the alternative? So the alternative, if, so the one, one alternative is to say we can't do it. Let's put it aside, <laughs> this is one, alter one alternative. Another alternative is to say, let's measure them at comparable real resolution. So if you have this one at 75 Mac one, have this one in 75 more, but I can't. I, I just can't. I can't put the dolphin, it's a big brain, and there is no MRI scanner that can measure it currently at 75 microns. And it just can be done. 
point. So we can argue at the end if it, if it means or the, if it, it means something or doesn't mean anything. Well, in general, in neuroscience, we want to understand our cognitive system, yes, so in general, but I want to understand if the connectome is a, is a parameter of, 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 of the brain, if it's important, if it's important to measure it. If, if, it's, if it's not important, then we can put it aside and, and not, <laughs> not deal with this method at all. So, so these issues in tractography, which I want, want, don't want to get, because they are very technical, we, we, we resolve them. So there was a result. What, if it's different, it's different. You want to have this difference. You want to measure this. If it's different, then good. I want, if, if, if a certain animal that has, for example, for example, we'll, get to, we'll see it in a minute, but if there, you have a certain animal that have very, very poor amount of white matter, just because this is what it is. Obviously, in order to have an efficient connectome, it will have to have this 15% of the brain white matter very efficient and complex and rich compared to other mammals. So just to say that we, in all of the analysis that I'm going to show you, the size of the brain was always a factor. And in all of them, it was found to be non-significant. And we, we controlled for, brain, for the resolution, so there are, uh, we could sample a small amount of brains at different resolutions, from 100 microns to about 500 microns, and, and see how that affects the, the amount of connection. It affects linearly, linearly, so we can control for that. So just, so there, I, I, I see there are a lot of questions about the resolution, but just to calm you a bit at the moment. So a way to look at it, if, if you think, if you believe that the amount of information is comparable, if you think so, what do you do with it? So we went uh, to use a method from the graph theory. So the graph theory says that when you look at the brain, which is very complex in its geometry, let's take it out of geometry and we create a, a, a connectivity matrix, which means for each voxel, not a region. Each voxel in the brain, what it is connection with all other voxels, and this is only part of the matrix because it was too big to display. Um, so it's a very huge matrix, and then you can do a lot of, of, of computations about it to see how efficient this matrix is, how, how, uh, what is the efficiency of getting from each point to any other of the points, and in graph theory you have a lot, a lot of, a lot of indices, of short mean path, and, and uh, whatever, there's a lot of, of parameters you extract from If there's a connection. Uh, yes. If there's a connection, there is, even if there is not. No, efficiency you calculate on the entire on the entire matrix. So you have you have now yes or no. Red is yes, zero is no. And then you take this matrix and you say what is, for example, one parameter is measuring the efficiency of, of the connection. How many steps on the average will take you from get from each point to all the other of the points. You average those and you get this kind of information. So, uh, so each starting point is a node in terms of graph theory and each tract is like a, a bridge and you can compare those and, and this is where you can calculate our efficiencies if it's a regular network, if it's a small world network which means that it is very efficient, if it's a random network, etc. So in tractography, it, it follows the streamlines. Follow the, the streamlines. So in, yeah. So in, in diffusion imaging, when you measure, so I don't, it, it is very technical and boring. But when you measure diffusion diffusion imaging, you measure the orientation of water motion. And the orientation of water motion, even if it's in a complex box that have a lot of fiber, you can extract what is the table, so it will be like an ellipse. And, and then you take the direction, and you start from one point and just follow the until it ends. Vector field. Right, a vector field, a very, very, you very, very and, and you cre recreate a straight flow line. Like, like in meteorology, it's... So it's connected is the probability, because as you say, you're tracking the, the, the temperature, so of course, the dog is the one way, or the other, and you're tracking the temperature, so you're tracking the temperature, so of course, 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 you're
Oh, you're getting all of them. Yeah, you, you do a. I, I can tell you a video technique, but you do a whole brain uh, tractography. You take each voxel and you start from. I think it was uh, three by three by three, 27 different locations within the voxel at a random manner, so you can ca compute all different paths that go through the voxels and connect those. So for each fiber, it's not just one direction, you can get 27 different directions. If it's a very homogeneous voxel, like the corpus callosum, all of them will be aligned. And if it's in the cortex, you might get a so bunch of them. Uh, in the matrix, yeah, it's about 250,000 by 250,000. But still, is it possible that you are missing some connections? Obviously. Well, nothing is perfect. Any sense of how many? What I'm missing? Yeah. Well, that depends on what order of magnitude you want to look at. All right? If you, I, I want to see, I want to see all the synapses. This is where I can't see all the synapses, and even if I can, I can't do the analysis. <coughs> what I'm missing? So we, we can talk. Let, let's see what I what I do see. If the it, if the, what do you mean? First, you need to believe the method. All right. When you do fMRI, I don't know what you do, but if people do fMRI and just get this yellow blob, this is where the brain functions, right? So if they believe it, this is where where you have functional activity. If you believe this method measures connection, if you find a connection, I agree that it's not accurate. Oh, it's a binary matrix. It's a binary, binary yeah. matrix. We can waiting all that. We can have wait from that. If you measure the axon diameter distribution along the path, the path, another parameter, so the axonal density, the 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 cellular density, all these parameters, we can put them as different weights on the track. We haven't done that so far, but you can add those as other factors. Roughly. The matrix is the yeah. same, not the information. No, not the information. The matrix is right. roughly the same. Roughly the same. So what we get, what we get is that the mean short path, mean short path, when you put all the moments and this is only part of them because otherwise it becomes very complex to the eyes to look, have roughly the same the same mean short path regardless regardless brain volume. You might say that largest brains that have more white matter, like humans, we have 40% of our brain white matter, and the trident net here, that has only 15% white matter, that will be indifferent in the efficiency of that matrix, if we believe that it measures something that is important. But we couldn't find, so this trend is non-significant as a whole. No. I'm not measuring. Uh, I, I, I scaled. I don't. I don't measure it in millimeters. I don't measure it in millimeters. But that's that. The interesting question is the environment. The spread of this. Part. There are many parameters. You can look at. If, if variance is, uh, is interesting for you, we can look at the variance. What do you mean short? Short, like less. Say, go in and like, you have, you have, so it's in a drop track, you always have a higher probability for the short path and for the long path because the, the chance to go from one position to another, it gets high, it gets higher because... With, with diffusion yeah. tensile imaging. With probabilistic photography. With, this is not probabilistic, this is deterministic photography. Deterministic. Deterministic photography. The mean short path? Which means, so, so I'm not an expert in graph theory, so what I'm saying here is almost everything that I know. It just, <laughs> it just means what is the mean short, the mean short, the amount of nodes in terms of neurons, how many synapses you have to go, for example, for one neuron to get to any other of the neurons. So this. Yeah, if it will, if it will be, if you want to see what is the mean short path between two points that is co they are connected, it's one. And if they are between two points that are not connected, they have to go through other nodes in order to make a connection. So, so this is the other direction. When you show us, is that 
We didn't start a science, this will finish a science. So, the, the next is, okay, so somebody would, would say this is a very crude parameter, just looking at the old dimension. So one way is to start to segment the brain to its different components. For example, we can segment on the crudest way the connection to those that are commissural between the hemispheres, to those that are association between, within an hemisphere and projection fiber. And we started go from the commissural fibers just because we saw the highest variability there. It's not just we, sh we saw it only with MRI. It is well known that the, 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 the commissural is, is very, the commissural has a lot of variability across mammals and species at all. There are five commissural fiber systems in the brain. The, the corpus callosum is the one that we most know. There is the hippocampal commissure, which is tiny, tiny little in the human brain. Uh, the anterior commissure, which is even tinier <laughs> than that. And tiniest of those are the abenular commissure and the posterior commissure. And from those five, we looked on three of them, uh, the corpus, hippocampal, and anterior commissure, and reconstructed those, those for all the different mammals. So this is what you see in the human brain. This is the corpus callosum. And behind it, I will just make dim the corpus callosum a bit. There is the hippocampal commissure in blue and the anterior commissure in green. So we can reconstruct that for all the different fiber systems. So this is for the human brain, for example. And you can uh, see how it is variable compared for this uh, red kangaroo. Uh, it doesn't have a corpus callosum at all. It doesn't have a corpus callosum. All its commissural fibers go through the anterior commissure, as you can see here. So in red, just to remind you the color coding, red is fibers that cross from left to right. So corpus callosum, or here the hippocampal anterior commissure. This is the kangaroo brain, anterior commissure and hippocampal commissure. No corpus callosum. No corpus callosum at all. And, uh, and kangaroos are the not ancient in terms of their age. This is the most, uh, the animal that was the further along the, the branches of the evolution that we, that we measured. So you can imagine that the common ancestor of all the mammalians didn't have a corpus callosum, for example. And when you construct its fiber system, it looks like that. So you have a huge anterior commissure that goes all the way, very non-efficiently geometrically, but all the way from below to get to the neocortex of the kangaroo. So you see this over here, and the hippocampal commission. And we can could compare those. So, just for example, so this is for the marsupials, the kangaroo, and this is for the hyrax, Chopin Slaim. So you have here already has a very nice and thick corpus callosum. Uh, this is for the primates, the human brain, example. Rodents, so this is a typical, very nice corpus callosum, hippocampal, and very tiny anterior commissure. Uh, this is for a dog here, and this is for one of the best. For example, it, it's a comp it, we can now compare only the commissural fiber and see what are the distribution relative to the resolution, relative to the brain size, relative to all the others. And just to see how interesting it is, so these are two bats, the cave nectar bats and the fish eating bats. This is from Thailand, this is from Mexico. Very close on the evolution tee evolution tree. They are on the, for, of the same family, two, sub, two subfamilies. One with corpus callosum, one without. One without. Completely absent, not there. Which means that you have a dynamic structure, dynamic structure that is evolved. The, 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 the kangaroo doesn't have a corpus callosum. The primate brain, which let's say it's the last to evolve, has a very thick corpus callosum. In the middle, you can have uh, uh, different classes that within them you have huge variability in the, in the, in the way that, that the commissural fiber passes. I know. In Ladino, they say avagar avagar. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> Sorry? Well, only it's true, but you, you need to dig it. 
because some of these species were, they didn't do histology to all of them. And, and for example, for, for that bat, they didn't have corpus callosum, we tried to see, so Yossi said, your MRI doesn't know what it looks. Let's see if it's in storage. We, we found one paper from 18 something, 90 something, that says that they, 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 they looked at this, the brains, and they didn't find a structure that looks like a corpus callosum. Any, any new? Mm -hmm. uh, no, all the brains are still in, in formalin in, in, in the case that somebody will want to scan them again. <laughs> at the end, we'll do it. But I believe I'm alive better than histology, so. <laughs> so when you look at the variability, variability of the commissural ratio, you see that there is a huge variability across mammals for the amount of commissural fibers. And it's not only in the section to see if you have or you don't have. It's the amount of cortex that it connects. How much of the cortex the corpus callosum connects? Which part of the cortex it connects? And, and, and with tractography, you can, with this story, it might be more difficult. But you can see that there is a lot of variability between uh, uh, the different species. And just to put it in logic, so we have this matrix that across mammal we found that it has the same, roughly the same in short path. But you have a, a huge variability in the connection between them. So if the connectivity is efficient, is similar, the efficiency is similar across matrix, across mammals, if we could say that. If we have large commissural variability, large commissural variability, and then there should be some kind of compensation. Because if you take, if you take this tiny little bat that has very poor commissural fibers, only 15% and no corpus callosum and connect only part of the neocortex, etc., there must be some kind of compensation in order that the mean short path at the end will be similar to the human brain. So there must be some kind of compensation. And, and we first tested it on the primate. Uh, on the primate, that's because we have the largest corpus callosum of all mammals, to say the least, and it reduces quite dramatically. So from uh, a ratio of the corpus callosum passes about 40% of the fiber in of the fibers in the and passes through the corpus callosum only 10 or something of those passes through in the, in the marmoset, which is the pre simian that, that we had. And where the compensation should be in the other fiber system, if, if there. So we can reconstruct, for example, the association fiber system and look at them. So this is in the human brain. You have the arcuate, uh, uh, um, the, sorry, the, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, and not the only part of them, the uncinate, etc. And you can see how comparable they are across species. So the chimpanzee over here, we can reconstruct those. Um, the macaque, the macaque brain. It's quite different in terms of association. For example, because there is like a rumor in neuroscience, we have the arcuate fasciculus, the superior longitudinal fasciculus that is very thick and loud, related to our very, very nice language abilities but all the others, they don't speak or communicate less verbally, so they might have smaller superior longitudinal fasciculus. But you can find traces of it. You can find traces of it in their brain, just looking at the association fiber. So this is in the macaque, in the capuchin. Over here, you can see the other fibers, the lemur brain, and the mammoset. So in all of them, you can measure the association fiber system, and. And if anyone wants to go into neuroanatomy, you can see which these fibers connect are. Those are the ancestor of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. If somebody is interested in that, etc. Et and, and not only the primates, so we measure it for the entire, uh, the entire uh, database. And, and it's quite, quite complex uh, in all the mammals because those are very, very uh, strange structure. For example, to get to the visual system in the right brain, which is here, this inferior longitudinal fasciculus had to do this pass in order to get to get up there. Um, uh, so you need to have like an eye to, to which areas those are connected and somehow find the anatomy of the different animals. And also in the kangaroo, you do have some kind of association complexity there. 
And then the end, when you see what is the mean short path within an hemisphere, this is the association mean short path, and the commissural ratio, you see very nice compensation because animals that have very high commissural ratio have less efficient ratio of the mean short path, and those that have very low commissural ratio have more efficiency in the transmission of information within the hemisphere. So it compensates in a way that at the end, the entire mean short path that you measure stick to a certain amount of efficiency. Of efficiency, if you believe that these measures are meaningful. Another thing that you can do with it is to try and create an evolution tree that is based on this connector. So you can take the mean short path as the factor, you can take the commissural ratios, you can take a lot of them and try to construct a tree. This is, what it, this is not the tree, this is just, <laughs> just a sketch of the tree. But it looks like, it looks like that we, there will be some, some deviation which seems to be very robust from what we know from the genetic tree, from the genetic tree. For example, the genes, genes said that the, where are they? The Chiroptera, the bats, are specific class genetically. And one may think, one may think that this is because, well, they all have wings and they fly, and most of the genes encode disability. They need to encode disability. So this might cause some closeness in their genetic properties, and also in all the other bioinformatics, so when was the last mutation, etc. But in terms of the brain, in terms of the brain, the bats are the most widespread. There are some bats that their brain looks very, very, very similar in these connection properties, the, 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 the differences between commissural and association fibers, the amount of corpus can also be very close to the marsupials. And some bats, the representation of this fiber system are very close to the primate brain, in a way. And this is where environment comes in. Environment comes in. Obviously, environment has affected tremendously the evolution in many ways. And you can think of the fact that it was convergent and divergent and whatever caused it. But eventually, you can measure these things at the representation on the brain. And there are many questions you may ask me at the moment, but I will have very little answer for it, just because there is a lot of information we need to dig in. So I just wanted to give you an example, example of this database and, and the amount of information and some of the first observation. And I, can, I, I will appreciate any critique that you will have, because it is obviously good critique, because all the, all the things that you said are obviously correct and need to be considered. And what's yet? It's not the end. Okay. No, this is just, just a sketch. Just a sketch. Just a sketch. For, to do make a tree of the connectome, uh, uh, we, we just need to think what will be the best parameter. So one of uh, one of the so we are working with Hezi. Uh, Hezi uh, give us some. Hezi Shuron give us some kind of. of uh, advice on that and then from other people from computer science try to tell us how it's, it's available if anyone wants it can come it's about two something terabytes of, of data eventually now we are finishing you know just writing up a paper that will describe the database in the first observation and the intention is to put it on the web on the web and anyone can download it and do whatever they want with it um, An example, just an example. You can you can look you can look what on <laughs> you can look at anything. It's endless. Uh, the, what I wanted to say is that, that you have different approaches. One approach is to take everything, just put everything in one pot. You know, take the the fiber length and fiber ratio and the mean short path and efficiency and and, and uh, whatever the amount of nodes, the amount of da, 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 and put everything and make a tree out of it. it. It makes a lot of rubbish. A lot of noise comes out of, of these things. It's a, a lot of factors that some of them are contradicting. So, so one thing we try to look at is a different part of, of the connectome and see if it makes if it makes any sense. So, so this is just when that is the the amount of the connections and the efficiency is the same. Okay, the mean short path is the same. It doesn't change it. So, yeah, sorry, I have to say that the, if you take so we, we did it for the rabbit brain. From I think it was 
100 microns cubic to about 400 or 500 microns cubic. The mean short path was the same. The amount of information was completely different. The amount of fibers, if, if the parameter is important, was linearly scaled. Okay. Linearly scaled. The amount of information, so just to say very naively, is, is the amount of data that I scan. So if you have more resolution, you measure, you know, to the third amount of information just because. Just in a way, the file size. Yeah, you can it's, 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 well, it's, it's in the box area, so it's not. What is the variability within species? That's another thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have we have a lot of replicas for the, for, for humans, but. For some reason, there are plenty of macaques dying around. So there we have 11 of those, and then, then uh, yeah, so some species. Those are, in general, the the variance within within a species is smaller than the variance between different orders, different classes, no, different orders. Sorry, wait, different orders. Within different families, so within subfamily, it's, it's almost the same. So if you take uh, 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 the cats and the dogs are not uh, are not <laughs> not a good because uh, not a good example, but uh, I don't know crab eating macaque and uh, what with black tailed macaque. Okay, so these are two subfamilies. That you can't distinguish between them based on the conic tone. But with, within a subfamily, it's very homogeneous. There are some families that are distinct. There are some families that are distinct, some families that are close together, depending. What are other, uh, but we can finish here. Yeah, so there are issues about the dynamics of the connectome, but it will take a while to get to it, so I, I, don't, I won't start with it. Um, uh, so that measuring in vivo how the connectome changes in vivo based on any cognitive experience, but I think I gave the talk two years ago here, so <laughs> for those of you who have good memory or were present here two years ago, you must remember. Uh, so that's the MAMI database, this is the amount of this money. We'd be happy to take questions and thank you. say which, which voxel is that voxel in the other brain, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I don't do it at the moment. But one thing that is very... Uh, I, don't, I don't know which voxel corresponds. The matrix is almost the same because we measured the same matrix. We measured the same... The, same the, the resolution, not the resolution, the matrix size okay. in the acquisition, the number of voxels was almost the same across all mammals. So you have almost the same amount of nodes, almost roughly varies by 5% uh, between all. What we do now, well, what you, you wanted to do the, the, to see the cortical representation, get the different regions, for example, visual regions, somatosensory regions, etc., and see the differences in connection. The bad thing is that we have an atlas for the human, for the macaque, for the rat, for the mouse, for one bat, that's for the cat, this is where it ends. And the other 94 different species we don't have atlases for. So this is very constriction because I can't with my ass say this is where the visual system of the kangaroo starts or ends. One way we are looking in order to do it, so um, in the field of resting state of MRI, let's take a, a shift. Resting state of MRI, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with, is putting a subject in the magnet, asking him to do nothing, and just measuring the bolt signal and see how it flock to edge, and then they can get different networks, in the brain, the default network, whatever different network they have. About 17 networks, right? 17 networks uh, were found. Se 15, 17, depends how good you do it. And uh, what they did found, uh, people that are working in to could they connect Tom, Spons, et al., and this friend, found that you can explain or simulate with diffusion imaging, if you measure the connectome right, you can simulate about 75% of the resting state data based on structural information of the connectome. You can simulate. There are, there you, use, you use some equations of neuronal firing, etc. You can simulate that and recreate, and recreate uh, resting state information. 
and then do the connectivity analysis and define actually the same 15 networks based on fiber tracks, cortical networks. Now you're looking at the cortex because this is in the nodes. And the idea here is to do a project of a, of a project of triatome team because we can use the fiber tracks in order to recreate what would have been the resting state networks of all this brain and then the, see the similarity or modality of the, of the resting state networks. So then we will have cortical networks that we can compare across the species, but this is only starting now. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm serious about this because I think that the first thing you need is to corroborate this technique with the histology, and that, without that, you do not continue. But you say, uh, of course, histology has its own problems. So you have two techniques who have their own problems, but the question is, how good is the uh, correspondence? Because without it, I mean, this is a nice uh, game, but the question is, is it valid or not? Yeah. So first, just to have uh, a discussion, I said that it is better. I can't say if it's better or, or not. I, I, I can say that it's more attractive for first because you can measure it in vivo, to, 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 uh, uh, to say the first thing. In terms of histology, so obviously it will be very definitive. So if you do track tracing, you will find a very unique and certain connection between two regions and you will be certain that this is it, etc. You can't, it will be very difficult to see the variance of this connection along <coughs> this different samples of the same species or different species, etc. just because it will be technically com complicated. This kind of technology requires a lot, a lot, a lot of work, tedious work, and to do just, I've done some of it, a lot of time ago, just thinking of doing track tracing to 100 different species means that I will be dead by the end of the 10 species or something like that. It will be the end of my life. So obviously, there's a trade. -off. And then people might say how much validated it is. So in, in terms of, of fire, so that I, I didn't do this work, other people have done. There are false negative and there are false positive in, in fiber tracks. But all in all, in general, all in all, most of the, of, the, of the tracks are validated. They were shown very nice uh, um, um, with, with track tracing as that was done on the velvet brain in Denmark and in Germany. They showed very nice correspondence about the, only 10% false positive and 5% false negative. I don't remember the exact numbers, but there are. And what you can imagine that on a very, very large database with a lot of rep replicas of examples, those will average out as, as a noise. I don't know if they're there. So it depends what you look at. If you look at the entire amount of fibers, it's valuable. But if you look at commissural ratio, only very, very few percent to fiber, three percent, four percent, and this is very stable. So this is very stable within within uh, within species. So it depends which part of the connector. Some of it will be variable because of signal to noise and and we have very little control of how much time elapses since the animal died until the brain was nicely fixated, etc. So all these things affect, affect a lot. So these are noise. The larger the database will be, the smaller the effect will be. So we are increasing the database. Only today we got a hamus. Yes. I think you're using this magnet for brain Two, two magnets. So two magnets only. We have the seven Tesla for the smaller magnets until the size of seven centimeters. The larger go to the three Tesla, yeah, human scanner. Um, there are differences. Uh, what we did, so just to ease our mind, we scanned, for example, uh, just, so uh, one thing that nobody asked that all of these brains are dead, right? How it's affected. So we scanned, uh, and it's already well known, that, that the structure is actually better uh, acquired when the, when the brain is fixated, but we compared the connectome from a live red to a dead red to a red that was scanned on the seven Tesla to a red that was scanned on the, on the three Tesla and compare it. it. It's not the same, but it's roughly, it, it's not the source of the results. Right? So like by, by far not the source of the results. Okay,
No. No. No, it's comparable. It's comparable. Well, it depend, dep 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 depends how you define short and long, you know, it's, it's, it's like, the distribution, that's the distribution. As I said, if, if I could measure every, every, every connection, the long connections will be, the, will be very little, only 4% of the entire brain. Obviously, diffusion sensor has a bias towards those because it misses some of the tiny, tiny little connections within the quarter, so there's a bias. Um, uh, so the, the amount of fibers that are large, large scale connections are larger, but I can't say they are the, the majority, and I can't say that the small fibers are the majority, and it actually varies across the brain. But can you explain? No, no. We tried. We tried. It, it's, it's not me that I'm cautious about it. I'm cautious but positive, but he also is cautious and negative, and he tried anyway to see that MRI is wrong. He didn't succeed at so far, luckily. Tried ev really, literally everything, believe me. We tried to correlate it with any parameter we could find about this. Uh, this Thank you.